wonderful world of Disney. And now, your host, Walt Disney. Fly freely through the air like a bird has been one of man's oldest and fondest wishes. Many legends tell of this wish to fly. Perhaps the most famous tale of flight dates back to Greek mythology. It is the story of Icarus, who took to the air with wings made of feathers and wax. He flew too close to the sun. The wax melted and he perished. There are other legends of flight. Mercury, the swift messenger of the god with his winged heels. And Helios, the sun god with his flaming chariot. And of course, the famous magic carpet from the Arabian Nights. For a long time, flight for man was only a wish and a dream. But today, flying has become a reality. In fact, it has become commonplace. For instance, every day, many visitors travel to Disneyland by air using our helicopter service. Part of the service is to give the visitors this bird's eye view of the various lands of the park. There is Snow White's castle, the symbol of fantasy land. It's the land of storybooks and fairy tales where you can enjoy flights of fancy. You can fly in Peter Pan's ship through the skies of Neverland. Dumbo will carry you through the air using his enormous flapping ears for propulsion. Yes, man has ever traveled through the air in his dream. Yet he was chained to the earth until only recently. Just a few generations ago, all his transportation was earthbound. There's the old stern wheeler, the symbol of frontier land, the land of the pioneers, where you may relive the days of old and travel the primitive stage roads and railways. And there is still another land, Tomorrowland, with its symbol, the huge space rocket. This land is dedicated to the progress of man. When you land here, you literally find yourself in the future. watch the pilots of tomorrow. Today they play with models, but soon they will be designing and flying our future aircraft. Perhaps one of these boys might well be the first to explore outer space. Scientists promise that space flight will be a reality within a few years, but already today you can experience the thrill of space travel in Tomorrowland. To show you the tremendous vistas of future flight, we have built our famous Moonride Theater. Welcome aboard, friends. This is Captain Collins. The interior of this theater was carefully designed by scientists and engineers to look like a real passenger spaceship of the future. The eyes of the ship are the two TV screens called scanners. The one on the ceiling shows you where the ship is going, and the one on the floor shows you where you've been. Everything has been done to create a perfect illusion of a flight through outer space. In a moment, the bottom scanner will provide you with a dramatic view as we take off for our trip around the moon. please that was the breakthrough we've just passed the sonic barrier our altitude is now 25,000 feet we are still in vertical flight but soon our course will curve taking us over the north polar cap
rapidly leaving the Earth's atmosphere behind. And the upper screen shows our target, the moon, surrounded by the eternal blackness of space. Our ship is now approaching the orbit of the manned space station, which will come into view any moment. As you know, this man-made moon constantly swings around the Earth more than 1,000 miles above the ground. By using our built-in electronic telescope, we can also bring into view nature's own celestial bodies, such as this big comet. Its tail is a collection of extremely thin gases and cosmic dust that become visible as the comet approaches the sun. Our target, the moon, still appears off to the side. The superimposed chart shows you the planned point of interception. The speed of our ship and the moon's own motion will bring us together in space at exactly the right time. Navigation through space requires a careful planning of position and speed of the ship at all times. Our ship is now just about halfway to the moon. On the lower scanner, our Earth presents a beautiful sight. You can see it hanging in space like a huge bluish sphere illuminated by the sun. For the second half of our trip to the moon, our ship must reduce its speed and prepare to circle around the moon. It is accomplished by turning the ship over by gyro and then traveling tail first using our rocket engines for brakes. Our sister ship is on her return trip from the moon and by using our electronic telescope, we can watch her perform this operation. will execute this same maneuver, bringing our goal, the moon, into view on the lower scanner, since the ship is now flying tail first. People have always wondered about the other side of the moon, the side which is never seen from the Earth. But travelers through outer space can see for themselves that it is much the same as the side facing the Earth. We are now going behind the moon. And we must switch to the upper scanner where we can watch the dramatic spectacle of the moon eclipsing our Earth. We'll show you the dark portions of the moon's other side in the light of flares released from our ship. In their sharp light, the craters reveal their characteristic shapes. Scientists believe they were blasted out by the bombardment of huge meteorites when the moon was formed. As we complete our circle around the moon, the Earth again comes into view. Although the nose of our ship is now pointing precisely at the east coast of America, during the trip back, the Earth will, of course, continue to turn bringing California, our destination, into the proper position for our arrival, as indicated by the superimposed crosshairs. One of the things space travelers never do while in space is to look directly at the sun. But by again using our electronic telescope, it is perfectly safe for me to show you a picture of the sun, since we will view it indirectly. We're using a special instrument to block out the disk so that you can see the flames on the sun's rim. Those faint streamers of light are the corona. The electronic telescope reveals these solar phenomena called prominences. Under greater magnification, they're seen as tongues of glowing hydrogen reaching tens of thousands of miles out from the sun's surface. A large area of light seen without high magnification is sunlight, reflected from thin cosmic dust. It's called the light of the zodiac. Now on the lower scanner, you can see that we are leaving the moon far behind. And as we again approach the halfway point, we'll execute our second turnover. We'll finish our trip traveling tail first, ready to use our rocket engines for the delicate landing maneuver. 
We'll make our landing in Southern California about an hour before sunset. hear the roar of our rockets as we drop below the speed of sound. just experienced a flight through space, the flight of the future. It will be the final fulfillment of man's oldest dream, his dream to fly like a bird. But when did this dream first start? The art of flying cannot be credited to any one man or any one country. It is the result of many minds in a worldwide effort. We'll let each country tell the story of its own contribution. So let's go back through the mists of time to the very beginning, to ancient China. Come in, China. As early as 400 BC, our ancestors knew that hot air rises. So they filled hollow paper dragons with hot air and flew them. They were also the very first to populate the sky with other inventions. The kite, the rocket, and fancy fireworks. It is true, the Chinese created only toys, but at least they got something off the ground. The next contribution to flight came from Italy in the 15th century. Come in Italy. Few people realize that the creator of the famous Mona Lisa often neglected his paintings for his intense interest in science. The great Leonardo da Vinci developed theories of flight that were quite advanced for his day. And he tried them out with models. He built the first parachute. He also invented the helicopter, or as Leonardo called it, the aerial helix. The models were crude, and strangely enough, they flew. But not without mishap. People of his time were very superstitious and thought that these machines were inventions of the devil. So, Leonardo withdrew and returned to his painting. But he never gave up his secret desire to give wings to man. He wrote his notes in reverse to preserve their secrecy. And being left-handed, he could do this easily. So, we encountered the first classified technical information in the very beginnings of aviation. It is my belief that man can fly by the power of his own muscles. I have designed this equipment to duplicate the wing structure of the bird. After Leonardo's death, a mirror revealed the meaning of his notes. His designs were called ornithopters or mechanical birds. It was found that they could indeed duplicate practically every motion of the bird except flight. But 
But 200 years later, man did fly for the first time. This chapter leads us to France. The year was 1783. Two brothers, Joseph and Adienne Montgolfier, shared the dream of flying. By chance, they noticed charred bits of paper rising from the fire. That gave them an idea. They experimented with a bag made of paper. When the hot air filled the bag, it too was carried aloft. Elated by their discovery, they proceeded to build a big bag. It was a ramshackle affair of paper and linen held together by buttons and buttonholes. When this bag was filled with hot air, it swiftly rose 6,000 feet and covered nearly a mile and a half of countryside. Because of its size and shape, the brothers called it Balahun, which means big ball. Shortly thereafter, François de Rosier, using a Montgolfier balloon, became the first aerial voyageur in history. As a measure of safety, the balloon was tethered to the ground and permitted to rise only 85 feet. After a short time, the fire went out and the historic flight was over. When hydrogen gas became available, there was no limit to the time a balloonist could stay aloft. And so, man was launched into the era of lighter-than-air flight. Soon, all France was engaged in some type of ballooning which led to the foundation of the French Aeronautical Society. To celebrate the founding, Félix Nadar, a famous photographer and outstanding member of the Société, built a balloon to end all balloons. In the fall of 1863, he took 15 of his friends aloft on a celebration flight. balloon was aptly called the giant because this colossus was almost 200 feet high and 100 feet in diameter. The gondola was a two-story structure made entirely of wicker. It had all the comforts of home. Bedrooms with three-decker bunks, a kitchen and a dining salon. And there was even a dark room for Nadar's photography and of all things, a printing press. For several hours, the party cruised serenely above Paris. They failed to notice that the weather was changing. Société des Aéronautiques. Capitaine Nader tried to land, but the giant was completely at the mercy of the elements. The Géant traveled some 400 miles from Paris to Hanover in Germany, where the balloon finally came to rest. As if by a miracle, no one was killed. Undaunted, Capitaine Nader restored his balloon and successfully made 29 more flights. The French were the first to break the bonds that chained men to the ground. But the future of aviation was with heavier than aircraft. 
This decisive step in the history of flight leads us to England. Early in the 19th century, the dream of flight caught the fancy of an English nobleman, Sir George Cayley. So he became a student of nature's own aeronautical designs and studied birds with the trained eye of an engineer. I have observed that a bird's tail is as important to flight as are its wings. Birds execute their various flight maneuvers by coordinating the action of their wings and tails. Evaluating these observations, I have designed a glider equipped with a tail and a rudder. When Cayley's glider was completed, he could hardly wait to test it. The honor of being the first pilot, he offered to his trusted coachman. It was a successful flight of 900 feet. True, the landing was a bit rough. The coachman, though unharmed, gave up a promising career and history's first pilot was never seen or heard from again. However, the flight was a milestone in aviation, earning Sir George the title of father of aeronautics and the British gold medal for aeronautical achievement immortalizes his pioneering work. To this day, all aeroplanes are equipped with tails and rudders. In 1884, the bird yielded another important secret to the searching mind of man. This leads us to the United States. John J. Montgomery, a professor from California, has often been called the forgotten pioneer of aviation because he never received full credit for his important discovery. Like Cayley, he was a diligent observer of bird flight. I have often wondered how gulls could have a motionless on windy days, yet had to flap their wings when there was no wind. Finally, I found the solution. A bird's wing is curved, but a curved wing forces moving air to flow faster over the top than along the bottom. Now, this creates a strong suction on the top of the wing that pulls it upward. And the faster the air travels over the wing, the greater the lift. So a bird can hover whenever the air is moving. So, from nature's own design, Montgomery built the first heavier-than-aircraft in the United States and flew it in many daring flights. He lifted his glider by means of balloons and launched them from heights of up to 4,000 feet. He piloted his glider through spirals and dives. He soared for 20 minutes at a time, covered up to 8 miles, and made landings at a pre-arranged spot. Few people of today know of the amazing work of this great American pioneer of aeronautics. Montgomery demonstrated that flying like a bird was no dream after all. In fact, he gave man his wings. At the turn of our century, man had mastered the first lessons in the art of flying. It was a humble beginning. But what amazing progress has been made since then. Fortunately, the motion picture camera had already been invented at that time, so that we possess a few records of these early flights. Man was challenging the birds, but his wings kept him airborne for a limited time only. Apparently what he needed was some kind of propulsion. Once 
again, nature's design was tried with success. The next step was for man to try it himself. Folks, here I am with a new device called the ornithopter. Through a system of leverage advantage, plus a man's physical power, I believe it's possible to fly as a bird. <clears throat> it appears heavy, it's light. Well, if at first you don't succeed, And so, more elaborate models were tried, and this time with leg power. Well, it was evident that muscle power would not do the trick. Fortunately, the gasoline engine had been invented by that time. And when it was combined with the glider, man really began to fly. We have prepared a special treatment of this golden era of flight. We let the book speak for itself. Two brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright, bicycle builders from Dayton, Ohio, on the morning of December 17th, set up on the sands of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, their first heavier-than-air flying. power of the rocket will boost future airplanes to heights never reached before. All through history, man has wanted to conquer the air. And now, space, infinite space, not the air, is the limit. Space. 